Mike, if you'd come and read our first passage. The first reading is from Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 10. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make path, your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring you health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Thanks for the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Mike. So, as I mentioned, the annual meeting is about three weeks away, May 15th. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about stewardship. Stewardship is a big word. It just means to manage well the stuff that we're entrusted with. And we're entrusted with all kind of stuff, certainly money. And we're going to talk about money today, and we'll talk about time tomorrow, or next Sunday, rather. Um, but we could just as well talk about other really important resources we have, our attention, our relationships, our opportunities, our know-how, and in some cases, our good looks. All good gifts to be stewarded, to be used wisely. But we're going to start with money, maybe because it's the thorniest, or at least can be prickly. I ran into a, a friend on Friday afternoon. He's also a minister in the area, and he asked what was going on, what I was working on. I said, well, I'm working on Sunday sermon right now. And what are you preaching on? I, I told him stewardship and money. He goes, oh, wow, never fun. <laughs> I go, wow, yeah. It can, talking about money can stir up a lot of uncomfortable feelings. It can make us feel anxiety or defensiveness or we can have feelings of guilt or fear. Also, some positive feelings like gratitude and thanks. But also, some really dark ones like avarice and greed when we're asked directly about our own financial situations, we can become nervous or embarrassed or kind of coy, thinking that maybe we're going to be perceived as having too much income or maybe embarrassed that we might not have enough income. It's kind of a taboo subject. Well, at least it is for boomers and elders. It's a little less so for Gen Xers and millennials. You know, but the Bible has a lot to say about money. In fact, if you on one counting, if you add up all the verses that talk about money and resources and our attitude towards them and our use of them, it's over 2,300 verses. 2,300 verses. That's more times than like love shows up or faith. It's a big thing because money is a big part of human life. Jesus talked about it. A lot. Almost a third of his parables were about money. You know, in the Old Testament, worship, public worship, corporate worship, so much centered around giving and sacrifice that it was unmistakable. There was so much weighing and remitting of grain that you might think that it's a, like a grange meeting. And there was so much slaughtering and roasting of animals that were given that you could mistake it for a giant barbecue. And, and there were so much festivals which people would come and sometimes bring a whole tenth of their annual crop and the fruit of the vine and the fields to be consumed by themselves and their family and their neighbors. Yet you would think that it was a frivolous open buffet and bar for even strangers that are passing through to celebrate. You know, there's so much giving and using and sharing, and perhaps we might even look at it as wasting the good gifts of God that were part of that public worship. It was unmistakable. 
But for our worship, it can almost seem incidental, even like a small piece of it. You know, I had this recollection that I, I couldn't find much about the collection or the offering in the Encyclopedia of Christian Worship. So this Christian Library of, of Christian Worship, it's a it's a eight volume set, it's like this big, and a library. And I I thought, you know, I don't remember reading much, so I drove back to Gordon's campus and I looked up. Sure enough, about 300 words in an eight volume set about giving. We just don't think about it much, you know. But money is powerful. It has a way of worming into our hearts and our minds. We get wrapped up in our emotions sometimes. Sometimes, maybe it's because money is so fungible, right? We think we can trade it, like for all kinds of things. Commentators and journalists don't even bat an eye by equating how much a politician has raised for their campaign with the likelihood that they'll win. Because we assume money is going to equal votes. We just translate that way. Well, we make some similar assumptions too. We think, in our mind, we think money is going to equal comfort, or security, or power, or pleasure, or safety, or significance, or entertainment, or good times, or peace of mind. And of course, then there's the really important stuff in life, like fish tacos and ice cream. You know, money gets attached to all of those things. And yet it stirs up lots and lots of emotions. So I'm going to read the gospel lesson. It's from Luke chapter 12. You can follow along there. It's a big chunk. Uh, there's a, a little interaction and then a parable and then some teaching all around money. This is Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus, I like this, Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life doesn't consist of the abundance of his possessions. And then he told him a parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll be build bigger ones. And then I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink. And be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. And then turning to his disciples, he said, Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They, they don't sow or reap, and they have no storeroom or barns, and yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than the birds. And who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you can't do that little thing, then why worry about the rest? And consider the lilies, how they grow. They don't labor or spin. I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, it's thrown in the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you ones of little faith? And don't set your hearts on what you will eat or drink, and don't worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. Your father knows that you need them, and rather seek first his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So don't be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes in and no moth destroys. And for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus gets that there's emotion 
tied to money. Did you notice any emotional words in that reading? There were at least three that stood out to me. Greed, worry, and fear. All negative ones, you know. And Jesus warned, don't be greedy, don't worry, don't have fear. I want to talk just uh, in just a moment about God's remedy to worry and greed and fear. But first, let me make a, a note about a few things just from those passages that we read in Luke. In one is that material goods and wealth are good things. They are good things. You know, the, the farmer there, he, uh, he's not mocked or rebuked for prosperity that he enjoys. He has been, he probably inherited land and it's fertile land. Maybe he had something to do with that. Maybe he's a really astute farmer, but maybe not. Maybe he just inherited a good plot and it produces a lot. And that's a good thing. Do you remember when the Hebrews were leaving Egypt? They were going to the promised land. What was that described as? A land flowing with milk and honey. Good stuff to be enjoyed. Remember that passage that Mike read from us earlier in Proverbs. Honor the Lord with your wealth. The first fruits are your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. And your vats will brim over with new wine. Those are good things. So that stuff, the stuff of this world, is good. And we're to enjoy it. And secondly, there are gifts from God. I mean, everything that we have is not fully of our own making. Everything that we can do that turns a good profit, grows a good harvest, do, we do so with what we receive to work with. Sometimes that's material stuff. Sometimes that's opportunity. Sometimes that's insights that... We haven't gained from our own. All these things are good gifts from God. Or Psalm 145, 16 puts it, God opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. Or think about the ravens uh, that are fed, as Jesus said, or the lilies that are clothed. Sec or thirdly, all those good gifts from God that are for our enjoyment are not of principal importance in this life. They're of relative importance, secondary importance. The things that matter more are things like relationships, things like meaningful work, things like the ability to receive and enjoy beauty, but connection to others through service or pursuing causes that bring purpose and direction and meaning to our days the quest to know and enjoy God. All of these things, they're the stuff of life. The goods, they just make it more enjoyable and open opportunities along the way. You know, the farmer, he had this fertile field, but he thought that somehow by hoarding the abundance that he could buy freedom from work and comfort and leisure. And the story illustrates it backfires on him. He sorted all of his stuff. The Lord says, oh, you're foolish. You're foolish because now you're not get, you've missed the enjoyment of these things. You could have turned these into, the, into relationships in your community, but now you die and who's going to use it? Schopenhauer, you know, he said this, he said, wealth is like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you become. It's that way, or even a little bit closer to home, Benjamin Franklin. And if you haven't seen Ken Burns' piece on Benjamin Franklin, uh, it's worth watching on PBS. He was a remarkably generous guy. He didn't patent most of the things we know him for. We, he could have. But he said, no, these are good things that are given to us in the natural world. I just figured out how to use them. Let, let others go and do the same, you know. But he said this, money never made anyone happy. And it never will. The more one has, the more they want. Instead of filling a vacuum, it makes one. Imagine the farmer that Jesus talked about the year before. Maybe he just had a normal crop, you know, a harvest. What, did, what would he have done? He probably would have done what he had done in years past. He would have taken what he needed to eat, 
He would have saved some seed for next year. He would have taken his tithe to the temple. But now he has a lot. And that lot gets into his heart. He thinks, hey, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to build a big barn. He starts looking to that stuff to do what it just can't do. Provide him with something that it won't provide. Well, you know, Jesus says, this is the fourth thing about money, that we have to be vigilant. We have to examine our own hearts. We have to interrogate our own lives. Or as Jesus says it this way, watch out. Be on the guard against all kind of greed. Life doesn't consist of the abundance of your possessions. And he enjoys us, enjoins us, he instructs us to examine the way the world really works. Look at the natural world. Consider the birds of the air, the flowers of the field. Pay attention to the movements of your heart and seek first God's kingdom. Look for that and then the rest will come. Eric Nelson helped select for us the theme for the stewardship focus, which is that stewardship is heart work. And he's really right. It is heart work. Well, the, the answer to worry and greed and fear is the practice of generosity, of giving. I'll read to you a passage from 1 Timothy. It kind of echoes what we read in the gospel. It uses this phrase. It says, tell those who are rich in the present world. And um, though I don't always like to admit it, those of us in this room are rich in the world. On the world stage. How many of you have ever flown in a jet? Yeah, it puts you like in the top, what, 5% of the world's population? Something like that. You know, you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat tonight, let alone next Sunday night, because you can count on it being there, puts us easily in the top half of the world's comfort. This is what's written in 1 Timothy 6. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant or put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but rather put their hope in God who provides richly everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good Be rich in good deeds. Be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up for themselves treasures and a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. There's the instruction given to Timothy to give to his congregation. Help your folks not miss the life that's really life. Don't let them get distracted by possessions. Or as Jesus says, Life doesn't consist of the abundance of your possessions. So freely we receive, freely we give. And giving, the exercise of giving uh, is a way to keep our hearts in the right place. We sometimes talk about church giving as tithing. Tithing is a technical word. It means one-tenth. And it was the Old Testament practice. One-tenth of the everything that they earned for a year, given over. Now there are three things that tithing or giving, whichever percentage you're able to do, it does for us. And one is just very practical. It's kind of technical. Tithing in the Old Testament provided for the priestly class because they didn't have any land. They weren't given any land to work. They were given a temple to run uh, and all the priestly activities of that. So they and their families were dependent upon the tithe. Also, it cared for the ones who were dispossessed of their land through some tragedy and for strangers that, and foreigners that were traveling among them. It was like a social safety net. Giving here, uh, we use it differently, but it still pays my paycheck, keeps the lights on. It lets the worshiping that this community does to, together, lets that keep happening providing for our own going, ongoing growth and faith and the spiritual education of our kids, a witness and service to our neighbors, and a support of some mission works, missionary work abroad. So it's practical. Money can be turned into useful things, and it is. Secondly, that practice of giving generously is spiritual work. It's hard work. It does spiritual stuff. You know, this Old Testament 
sacrificial, sacrificial system, I, as I mentioned before, so filled with giving. But the point was that God didn't need cattle to be sacrificed because he was hungry or something like that. It was always about their heart. There was First Samuel, the, the, the uh, priest and prophet, says the Lord doesn't take delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices. He doesn't take delight in that as much as he does in obeying his voice. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. As I said, the giving, it's, it's not just about the giving, it's about what your heart does. King David realized this when he got himself in trouble with adultery and fornication and murder. He's repenting. And he says to the Lord, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You're not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. And then uh, the prophet Amos, speaking for God, even puts it more vehemently. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I don't accept them. And peace offerings and your fatted animals, I won't even look at them. Take them away from me. Your music and your songs of your the harps. But rather, this, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And giving that's not accompanied by justice and righteousness. When our relationships with one another are out of whack and our heart is in the wrong place, then giving doesn't matter. You know, this uh, past New Year's, Laura and I sat down to to do an exercise that I don't, I don't really like doing. Really. Uh, we reviewed our giving for the year. You know, we kind of considered where we might increase or need to increase, what projects maybe had come to a close. We decided that uh, as had been our practice for our whole married life, we'd take a tithe, one-tenth, and we'd divide it between the local church and between local, national, and global causes that are working in a variety of ways for God's kingdom, different places, different people. And we realized that we weren't, hadn't been on target, so we recalibrated our giving to more truly reflect 10%. And I wouldn't be honest with you if I didn't say I was feeling stubborn and unhappy about that conversation. Oh, okay, whatever. Just do it, you know. You know, there's a, uh, a guy that was, did his undergraduate studies at Gordon, Christian Smith, and went on to become a, a professor of sociology. He's at Notre Dame now. He's one of the leading sociologists of religion in, in the country. A while ago, he and a colleague uh, did a, a study on giving, especially giving in churches. And the good news is this, is, you know, that Christian folks who, who take faith seriously give about four times as much as those who don't. The kind of sobering news is that even Christians don't give very much. About 20% of those who identify as Christians in America don't give any at all. They just, it's just not a habit for them. And those that do give intentionally give not that much, between 2 and 4%, you know. They, uh, they conducted a little experiment with the people that they interviewed, and they asked, what would happen if it became a requirement for church attendance that you tithe to the church 10% of your income? And this is what they found, that about 7%, 7 out of 100 would say, okay, I guess that's what we have to do. 76% said, no way, I'm not giving a cent. <laughs> A negative response, right? Well, Laura and I's exercise resulted in rebalancing our giving to reflect truly 10%. You know, and and it it is a, a practical thing. It really does do practical work. I, I like that we give some of our money to folks who are doing church planting, some folks who are doing emergency relief work on the ground, some organizations that do a policy work to try to work upstream a little bit, to, to write the laws of how we organize our life together. And of course, we give here too. But in the end, the exchange is really well worth it. Because we invest in, we partner in relationships 
and programs and institutions and causes that we care about. It's putting our treasure to use in God's kingdom. So tithing or giving has practical, technical applications. It has spiritual implications for our hearts. It also has cultural implications. It, it, it lives differently than the way the world lives. It shows that another way is possible, points to an alternative reality, an alternate uh, economy, an economy where justice hopefully will roll down and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Well, tithing is just a, a part of our life of stewardship. And it's about our heart in the first place. This is, can be an uncomfortable conversation for me, and here's where it gets uncomfortable. Not that I, I think I'm uncomfortable talking about giving. I'm absolutely convinced that it is a perfect way to navigate our heart's relationship to the good gifts of God. It's to be thoughtful about our giving, to be generous and courageous even when we give. And I'm not hesitant about encouraging you to do that. And in fact, I, I want to challenge you to have a prayerful conversation with others in your household and with God. Uh, to do it ab about where you give and how you give. For all the reasons I've already mentioned, the practical reasons, the cultural reasons, the spiritual reason, reasons. Um, and I, and, and I, some folks would just say, in the, and I know God's will for you is to put all that giving here, the church. I don't know that, and I won't say that. And I actually trust that in this little, the ones who are gathered in this room today and the ones who are watching us on Zoom, that actually I, I get excited about thinking about the little tendrils uh, that are out in the world doing good work by the way you give your time and attention and money to other things, medical research and, uh, uh, and rehab centers and church planting efforts and uh, lobbying for more just laws, whatever it is. But we do need some to come here to keep things going. Uh, so that's where, uh, you know, it's a little uncomfortable for me. I'm not going to tell you what percentage of your income you need to give. I would encourage you to pick a percentage and then stretch yourself to it. And I'm not going to tell you where to give it, but I will let you know that we do need giving here to keep things going forward, and I'm grateful. Uh, for the history over the last five years of generous giving in this place. But as you receive those second mailing in the, in the mail this week, there will be a card in it. It's like this. We call it an estimate of giving card, and it's meant to facilitate two things. One, it's feedback for the executive committee as they think about the budget for next year. I don't see these. Uh, only the stewardship team does, and the executive committee only sees the the aggregate, not individual names and what. So, I don't know. A lot of pastors do. They know that stuff. I don't. I I uh, that's I keep myself from knowing who's giving what. So it's helpful to us. But the other reason, the more important reason, is this is a little tool as for a spiritual exercise for you to think. Okay, what are we doing? What can our family afford, and can we give more to God's work in this world in a way that helps um, realign our heart to the things that matter most. So uh, we will be collecting these things next Sunday. So uh, towards the end of the service, we'll ask you to, to turn those in. There's one half you can keep at home if you need a note for yourself. The other you collect there and uh, the treasurer and the executive committee will consider that as we look at next year's budget and make some planning. But I do hope for you it's a helpful exercise and one that isn't filled with anxiety or fear or worry, but rather with joyful generosity of counting the good gifts that you've been given and thinking joyfully about what they can do in this world. Uh, I'll invite you to stand for a final hymn. I'll tell you just a little bit about it. It's an old poem. It comes from the 8th century, a guy named John of Damascus. John was a, a Christian guy in Damascus, but his dad worked for the Muslim caliph in Damascus, and when his dad died, John inherited the post. So he lived in great wealth 
He had servants, slaves, lots of income. Uh, he ate really well, but when he was about 40, he got dissatisfied with that life. He realized that his heart wasn't growing the way he wanted it to. He re released his servants, he gave away his wealth, he joined the monastery at St. Saba's in the desert of Jerusalem, and he wrote poetry. One poem we're going to sing right now. It's 298, the day of resurrection. 